Good morning, church family. Man, it's great to see you guys here. It's hot outside and humid, so summer is in full effect. Man, we kind of got a pass on it for a while, didn't we? Anybody notice that June just really never showed up? Was it just me? Yeah? Uh, no, I was, I, I was not upset about that. When June was like, hey, we're going to take a break, I said, hey, June, I'm good with that. Enjoy your rest. And then July is like, I'm here. <laughs> And uh, we all know it. So if you're watching online with us, I want to say welcome to everybody that's watching on Church Online. Would you welcome them this morning, church family? We're excited to have you guys joining with us. We're kicking off a brand new message series in the summertime here. It's called Summer at Peak City. So, you know, the title's kind of self-explanatory. But we are really in a, in a process, in a season where everybody's kind of uh, resting or doing some different things, visiting with family, traveling around a bit, and if that's you, if that's what's going on, uh, what we want is to make sure that we don't lose sight of what matters most, okay? It's easy when rhythms change to take the most important par parts and aspects of our life and say, you know what, uh, we're just going to shift that up for a while. And three weeks later, you've gotten out of some of the best habits you've ever formed. So we want to talk about some of those things in this series that we're going to stay tracking on that's going to help us to continue to thrive in our relationship with Jesus. And today, it's all about prayer. Now, some of you, you hear that and you're like, yes, we're going to talk about prayer. Some people hear it and they're like, man... Okay, it's going to be like a workout for me just to listen to this. You know, some, for some people, prayer is a great thing. You get excited about it. For others, it feels like work. Uh, maybe you're somewhere in between. Anybody ever wondered why some prayers get answered and some don't? Anybody? Wow, everybody in the room here, okay. Uh, that's a great question. I think that's one of those things that we'll know when we go to be with Jesus in heaven. Uh, here in the meantime, what we can do is we can look to the Scriptures, and we can look at examples of praying people and examples where people prayed earnestly and God answered. And if we do that, I think if we emulate the lives of some of these folks, what we're going to see is a shift in the way that we pray, a shift in the anticipation with which we pray. And when that happens, I believe we're going to see God move much more powerfully in our lives and in the lives of people around us. So today, I want us to go to the book of Daniel. Actually, we're going to be in Daniel chapter 9 today. So if you've got your Bibles, you can turn there. We'll put the scriptures on the screen as we come to them. Uh, but for today, I just want you to lean in. Daniel chapter 9, I'll be reading out of the ESV. All right. Now, a lot of us, we've been in crisis mode before. And we felt like when we prayed, we got no answer. And I mean, I've been there before. I mean, I had my back against the wall. I was at the point where it's God or it's nothing. Like the natural means have been exhausted. I'm staying on my face before the Lord. He's going to have to move or something's not going to happen. Ever, anyone ever been in a situation like that? Anybody? Am I the, okay, several of us. So if you've been in that place, but you felt like you got no answer, I want you to know that you're not the only one. Also, we can see in the scripture someone else that was in that same boat. His name was Daniel. So if you look in the Bible, in the Old Testament, the first half of the Bible, those books are grouped into certain sections. It starts off with the law, and then it goes into this literature called the wisdom literature, wisdom and poetic literature. So that's Psalms and Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. Uh, then, then you get into this section called the major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, you know, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel. Those are called the major prophets because those books are bigger. That's why. The minor prophets, they weren't less important, like poor Habakkuk, just a minor prophet. But Daniel, a major prophet, it's not like that. Uh, what, what you got going on is there are shorter books of the Bible, so they refer to those prophets as the minor prophets prophets. So Daniel, grouped into this book section of the Old Testament called the Major Prophets here, he, when we first see him in the story, is 15 years old. Can you imagine being a 15-year-old prisoner of war? Because that's Daniel. He's a 15-year-old prisoner of war when we meet him and we start reading about him in that book. And then what we're going to look at today is all the way in Daniel chapter 9. So fast forward in Daniel's life now. He is 85 years old. 85. 
So now he's gone through the process of living his life, and what happens is he keeps getting promoted. He's a man of integrity, and these pagan kings that have overthrown Jerusalem, overthrown Israel, and then another king comes along and overthrows that king, and another king comes along and overthrows that king, all of these pagan kings have had Daniel serving in their royal court because he's, a, he's brilliant, he's bright, he's a man of integrity, and he keeps on getting promoted. I mean, so we see that the Babylonians came in, they defeated the Assyrians. Daniel gets promoted. Then the Persians came in and defeated the Babylonians, and Daniel gets promoted. Now, he's living at a time where he knows that there's been a prophecy. Daniel knows in chapter 9 that the Lord prophesied that there would be 70 years of exile for the, for the children of Israel. They would be cast out and scattered from Jerusalem. And after that 70 years... The Lord would regather them back once again. And Daniel knows about this. This is a prophecy by Jeremiah. And Jeremiah and Daniel, they're living in the same time, right? They're contemporaries when they're living at the time here. And so this prophecy he knows is going to come to pass. And it's time for this to happen. It's time for deliverance. But Daniel's not seeing this happen. So he's in crisis. And Daniel turns to God. So when he turns to the Lord, he begins to pray earnestly. And we can see how he prays in Daniel chapter 9. And I want us to look at this today because this is going to help mold and shape the way we pray. Here's what I truly believe. That if a lot of people understood more about praying the will of God, that they'd pray a lot more. And there's a lot more people out there if they pressed in and leaned into and prayed the way that God desires for us to pray. And they saw God answer that they'd pray a lot more. Now, catch what I didn't say there. I didn't say, if you pray this way, God's gonna do whatever you want. Because if you just heard that, I'm so glad you're here this morning at Peak City Church. We're, we're glad that you joined us for worship today. Uh, we're all gonna learn something. God is not a slot machine. Prayer, what it does is it helps us conform to the will of God. Can I say that again? What prayer helps us do is to conform ourselves to the image of Christ, to the will of God. We become more like Jesus when we spend time talking with Jesus. We become more like Jesus when we spend time reading his word and trying to align our life with what he wants. And then when we pray in his will, we'll see him act. We'll see him answer. And friends, even then, it may not be the answer that we're asking for. It's... Seldom, seldom is it the answer we're always looking for, but it's always the best answer. All right, so let's look at what Daniel did. So this is, this is what he did. He went through these steps of prayer in this crisis moment, and God answered. All right, so let's look at this together. I'm going to give us six steps to answer prayer modeled by Daniel here. This is going to come out of Daniel chapter 9. But I want to go ahead and tell you what the first step is. And this is one we miss. The first step that we see here is the listening step. You got to let God speak to you. Friends, you might say, well, you know, I get quiet and I don't hear God say anything. Okay? If you feel that way, if you're in a dry season, I've got 66 books full of God speaking to you that you can pick up and you can read and you can meditate and you can let the word of God speak to your heart. Will the Holy Spirit speak to you? Yes, he will. And if you try to say you're gonna put the word over the spirit, you're doing it wrong. But if you're ardently asking for the Holy Spirit to speak and you're staying in the word of God, I promise you, he will speak to your heart. Let him do that. We've gotta take a moment in our prayer life to listen. This is what Daniel did. Let's start out and, and see what we see here. All right, in the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, by descent, a Mede, in other words, Darius of Mede was this guy's name, all right, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, perceived in the books the number of years that according to the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet, must pass before the end of the desolations of Jerusalem, namely 70 years. So while he is serving in this wicked king's court, he's reading the word of God. And while he's reading the word of God, he sees a promise from God. 
Listen, there are promises, there are thousands of promises for you in God's word, but you won't know what they are unless you read them. You won't perceive that in your heart and your mind unless you actually get these off the page into your heart. So we've got to read his words. He says he read the word of the Lord and realized that we are at the end of a 70-year period of exile. So he sees and he studies and he learns. And Daniel was a praying man. The Bible says that he prayed three times a day. He knows the promises in the word. And so Jesus, he actually echoes the same thing that Daniel is doing right here. He, it, basically, he's saying this is so important that we stay locked into, grafted into the word of God. Jesus says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. So if you are staying grafted into Jesus, if you're walking in his word and in his will and you're doing your best to be able to align your life with Jesus, the requests and the desires of your heart start to emulate the desires of God's heart. If you're living that kind of life, then Jesus himself says, ask whatever you wish. So Daniel says in this listening steps, we have two jobs here in the listening step. Stay connected to God and keep his word in your heart. So how do we stay connected to God? I would say if there's anything in your life that's getting between you and your relationship with him, rearrange your priorities. Put him first. Let him get your best. Make him your highest priority. If there's sin in your life, hey, repent of it. Yeah, Jesus died and paid for sin, past, present, and future. But if there's something going on in your life, if there's some sin stuff that you need to lay down before Jesus, maybe there's some addiction stuff that you need to lay down before Jesus. And I'm not just talking about substance. We live in a day and age where little devices and things like that want to occupy every single bit of your time. The opinions of other people, they can become the most important thing in your life, and that can be like a drug. If there's some stuff like that, you need to say, hey, God, I've let this become too much of a priority in me. I repent. I'm turning away from that. I'm coming to you. Then do it. Stay connected to God. If there's things in your heart where God's saying, hey, I want that. I want, you to, I want you to release that to me. I want you to submit that to me. And you've been acting in disobedience to that. And only you can answer that question. Surrender that to God. Then, after you've done that, keep his word in your heart. Stay in the word. Ask him for his promises that he's promised in, in the word for you and for me. And Daniel did this. We should all seek God, every single one of us, throughout the day. And we should all have a focused point in the day where we say, God, this is your time. And we're gonna offer that to him and let that be sacred. Listen, and this isn't something that weak Christians do. I'm just gonna tell you like it is. This isn't something, man, let me just speak to your hearts. Being a man of prayer is not for weak men. If you're fragile, like if, it may be a reflection of your prayer life. There's a strength that comes within. There's a wisdom that is, is put upon you by the Spirit of God when you surrender your heart and life to Him. There's a holy boldness that will rise up within you when you make prayer the priority of your life. When you start relying on His spirit to lead you in your decisions, when you start checking yourself in the words that you would say when you allow him to speak first, it's not for the weak. You know why? Because it will humble you. And fragile people build their life a lot of times on pride. And if you're going to stay surrendered to the word of God, it's going to change you. It's going to slay that pride. Ladies, can I speak to your heart here? Being a woman of prayer is not for weak women. It's not for women that live for the attention and the praise of other people. It's for women that so desire the Spirit of God to move within them. Their heart is wholly devoted to Him. That they want every reflection of their life, every echo of who they are to be a reflection of who Jesus is. That they don't want to be seen for how good they can run a, a business or a household. They want to be known by being a reflection of Jesus Christ. It's, it's, not, it's not for the weak. It's not for people that live for the praise of others. It's only for those that live for the praise of Almighty God. 
So what I'm talking about today isn't necessarily easy. But God never called us to easy. He makes things simple in his word. But he never called us to easy. Being an intercessor and a prayer warrior is something where you will spiritually see an impact all around you that won't just be in the spiritual realm. It'll impact the physical realm as well. But we don't get there just by saying, oh, I'd like to be that or I consider myself that. Or in today's language, you know, I identify myself as a prayer warrior. But if you don't pray, you're not. If you don't find time in your closet for God every single day. This is not who you are. It's just a nice idea of who you might want to be. Again, this is not for weak men or weak women. Are you tracking with me this morning? Daniel was a man of prayer. He saw kings and kingdoms come, go, rise, and fall, and yet God preserved him, upheld him, promoted him, and all the while he stayed on his face before God. It is the most important foundational thing that we can do in our spiritual life. That's why two times a year, we have 21 days of prayer and fasting. And our next fast is coming up on August the 6th. We're starting 21 days on August the 6th. We do this every year. Some churches just do 21 days of prayer. Hey, at Peak City Church, we do 21 days of prayer and fasting. Uh, because I do, wow, I, I do like 10 months of feasting. God's working on my heart. Y'all pray, okay? So we got some feasting, we need some fasting, in Jesus' name. Uh, but it's a time where we set aside three weeks to say, Lord, whatever you want, I'm praying big, bold prayers. I'm not going to insult you with this little piddly stuff. I'm going to pray because you're the God that can move mountains, and there's some that need moving. And I'm calling on you to do that. And when we do this, when we, when we get serious about what we're doing, when we pray, we see God move supernaturally. I don't know if you remember this. There was a time where we were praying, God, we need some land to be able to build a church, and then out of nowhere, oh, it's just like, it just, it just kind of happened. No, it didn't. It didn't just happen. It's because the prayer warriors got on their knees, and they sought the Lord, and God opened a door that no one else could open. Right now, we're in a phase where we want to build something on it, and we need provision for that. So will you join me in those prayers, saying, God, we know there's a harvest of souls that you're going to win. You're going to use this new campus to be a part of that process. Would you please provide everything we need to get it built, open all the doors for permitting, let it go faster than we could have ever thought possible, and just pray those big, bold prayers with us. I believe that when we pray, and if it's honoring God and it's praying along to his will, he's going to say yes to that. So we're going to engage in prayer together starting on August the 6th. In fact, during those 21 days of prayer, we got three Sundays. And what I'd like to do is we're going to have special prayer time between our two services. So we have a 915 worship time and 11 o'clock worship time. So around 1030 or so each week during those three weeks, we're just going to have some, some quiet worship music playing in the auditorium here. And we're going to invite people to come for prayer. Whatever you need prayer for, if you just want to be a part of praying corporately, we're just going to have a 10, 15 minute time of prayer between those worship services. If you want to be involved in that, mark your connect card and let me know. All right. Praying. This is what Daniel's doing. And he's reading Jeremiah. They lived at the same time. Jeremiah, he actually stayed in Jerusalem when all the desolation had come. And this is what Daniel was reading when he said, I saw the promise. 70 years has come into pass we're not going to be exiled anymore. And you know this verse. You might not think that you do, but you do. Jeremiah 29, verse 10, it says, For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you. I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. And then the verse we all know. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. So we know that verse, but we often don't read verse 10. We like the 11th verse. And then we leave out verse 12, which says this. And then you will call upon me, and you will come, and you will pray to me, and I will hear you. Friends, God has a purpose and a plan for your life. But we miss it when we don't seek him. I think there's so many things that are going on in your life right now that God wants to say yes to, but you're not asking. You're not seeking him. And there's so many things that he wants to give and bless. He wants to pour out. He wants to do something in your life. But oftentimes we simply aren't asking. Now, here's the two factors in this I want to point out. It's God's timing 
and my praying. So there's a time when he is going to do it, but then there's the time that we have to be asking for him to do it. God says to Israel, 70 years in exile, and not a moment sooner will you come out of that. But you have to pray and I will listen. Daniel's looking around going, wait a minute, 70 years, we're still in exile, what's going on? But then the word doesn't just say, I know the plans I have for you to prosper you. It says, when you seek me, when you seek me, you come and pray to me, I will hear you. See, there's nothing in God's plan for our lives that happens outside of his timing, okay? God's timing and our praying. There's nothing that happens in our lives that happens outside of God's timing. If the timing's wrong, it's not going to happen. I, like for me, for example, a, a real, real example of my life, God called my wife and I to say yes to planting a church back in 2017. Never in my ministry career did I dream about planting a church. God didn't even let that become a dream in my heart until 2015. But when he planted that there then, there was nothing I could do to shake it. His timing. But you know what I was praying all along for years, for decades before that? God, whatever your will is for me to do to serve you, I will do it. Please just show me. Show me your will. Show me what you want. I'm not going to get up and move and be driven and tossed by the wind. I'm only going to move when you move me. Those prayers were prayed and a foundation was laid for the longest time. And praise God, when he told Angie and I that we're going to plant a church, he told her first, can I get an Amen. She didn't come and tell me that, though. I don't have time to tell the whole story, but God spoke very clearly to her heart. And then when I breached the subject to her, she let me know that God had already spoken those things to her. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Wow. Anyway, let's move on. God's timing, our praying. So many things in God's timing, but we don't pray or ask for it, and then it doesn't happen. And God is not going to force his plan on you. Can I say that again? God's not going to force his plan on you. He wants to use you. He doesn't have to. God doesn't need you. He's God. He wants you. Can I get an amen? Like he wants to work through you. He wants to speak to you. He wants to move in power through your life. But he doesn't have to. God's timing, our praying. And this is a beautiful display of what I believe is God's sovereignty and your responsibility. God's sovereignty and your responsibility. God has timing. That's his sovereignty. You have and I have praying. We have not because we ask not. That's James 2, 4. So, hey, there's letting God speak to you. Daniel did this. And then he goes into this place where I call this the seeking step. And that's when you focus your attention on God. So Daniel chapter 9, verse 3, it says, So I turn my face to the Lord God, seeking him. I remember when my children were little, especially Caroline and Nate, they would grab me by the face and they would look and they'd say, look at me when I speak, daddy, right? Nate, when he was little, he would say, dad, look me in the face when I talk. Okay, son. And then he'd run away. Like that's just how he behaved. But they wanted your full focused attention. And God wants that in the same way. When we're actually spending time with him, eliminate the distractions, Get in a quiet place. Don't let your phone be anywhere near you. Notifications off. It is time to spend with God. Completely focusing our attention on him. You see, sometimes I pray out loud. Sometimes I'm looking around. When I'm talking to God often, I find myself looking up towards the sky. Because I'm just, I'm looking to the Lord. I'm trying to posture myself in a way that's seeking God. It goes on, Daniel chapter 9, verse 3. It says, so I gave my attention to the Lord to seek him by prayer. There are so many seeking promises from God in his word when we seek him. So let's look at what the Bible says just on those that seek him. Amos 5, 4 says, seek me and you will live. Proverbs 8, 17 says, I love those who love me, and those who seek me diligently find me. Jeremiah 29, 13 says, you will find me when you seek me with all of your heart. Hebrews eleven six 6 says, God rewards those who earnestly seek him. So don't miss this step. We let God speak to us, and we focus our attention 
on God. So many times, the pain that we endure in life is the result of not seeking God. And I'm not saying that it'll make the pain go away. But I am saying that he will be an advocate that walks with you, that gives you the strength to endure even through the greatest hardships of your life. And when you stay close to the Father, he will be a shield all around you. God is faithful. Focus your attention on him. Then we see Daniel starts to pray with passion. So that's a step for us. Pray. When you pray, don't just, okay, Lord, here I am. You got this. All right, later. Let's, let's actually ardently pray. I think the way that you ask matters. Uh, any parents in the house? This is the, let me just ask you a question. When your child wants something, does the way they ask you matter? Does that factor into that yes or no? Okay, if it doesn't for you, I think it does for me. I will greatly and readily admit that. And I believe that when we pray, the way that we ask matters. God gave us emotions. The Bible says of God himself that God is happy, sad, angry, jealous. He feels these things. He gave us emotions. He created us with them. And this is the way Daniel prays. He says in verse 3, he says, And I began pleading with God earnestly in prayer. I poured out my heart, bearing my soul to God. He prayed with passion. The Bible says the fervent prayer of the righteous avails much. It doesn't say the weak, flippant prayer where you pray it once and forget about it avails much. The fervent prayer of the righteous avails much. Let's go back to this uh, to the prophecy in Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 50, verses 4 and 5, it says, In those days and in that time, declares the Lord, the people of Israel and the people of Judah shall come together, weeping as they come, and they shall seek the Lord their God, and they shall ask the way to Zion with faces turned towards it. They were weeping and passionately seeking God. The way that we seek God matters. Your tears matter to God. It's not lost on him when you seek him with passion. You don't nag the Lord, by the way. He wants you to ask. The Bible tells us this. Jesus said, ask, seek, Knock, like keep on pounding on the floor of heaven, asking for God to move. If there is someone in your life that you love that needs healing or is far from God that doesn't know Jesus, ask, seek, knock, don't give up, don't lose passion, don't lose that faith and belief that God can do what you can't. We've got to pray with passion. And if we're doing that, Daniel shows us the next step. He says, you pray with passion, and then he shows us we've got to demonstrate our seriousness. And I'm, I'm going to get to what I mean by that. We demonstrate our seriousness. Daniel, in verse 3, it says, And I started fasting and went without food to show my sadness I put on rough clothes and I sat in ashes. That was a cultural thing. Putting on sackcloth and ashes to show that you're mourning. And then he fasted. He quit eating. He was showing God, hey, how, this is how serious I am about seeking you, that you would fulfill this promise to bring us out of exile. God promised it, but it's God's timing and our praying. Friends, again, I want to say it. It's God's timing and it's our praying. Can we be a people that seek him passionately, demonstrating our seriousness? Some of you say, well, why fast? Why quit eating? It says to God, I'm serious. Moses fasted, he received the Ten Commandments. Israel fasted, and God gave them victory over warring armies that wanted to overthrow them. Daniel asked for wisdom, and he fasted, and God gave it to him. Nehemiah fasted before he rebuilt the walls, before he asked if he could get the materials to rebuild the walls, which the king could have murdered him for asking that very question. But he prayed to God and he fasted before that happened. Jesus, when he was tempted in the wilderness, he fasted for 40 days. The first Christians sat in an upper room praying and seeking God. They weren't eating in that upper room. They were fasting and seeking the Lord. And all of a sudden, Pentecost broke out. You see, it demonstrates your seriousness when you do this. This is why we do it twice a year. Because I want the church to be focused on prayer, and I want us to demonstrate to ourselves and to God that we are serious when we say, Jesus, you are enough. Some of us feel like there's so many other things that could satisfy us in our life. Let me tell you, your prayer life is off. 
when you get settled back into understanding that he is your source and your sustainer, when you have a prayer life that reflects that he is your portion every day of your life, then all of a sudden you'll see that when you come and you say, God, I don't need food, I don't need entertainment, I don't need distractions in my life, for this season all I need is you, then you're going to see him move in power in ways that you've never known. It's almost like the nuclear bomb of spiritual warfare when you fast. Amen. Okay, just me. If you want to amen in the chat at Church Online, you go right ahead and do it, okay? So we demonstrate our seriousness. And then... The next step is this. Daniel then goes and he thanks God for his promises. He thanks God for his promises. The Bible says, Then I said, Lord, you are a great and awesome God. This is verse 4. You always fulfill your promises of constant love to those who love you and keep your commands. He thanks God. In Daniel 9, verse 9, he says, Even though we've rebelled against you, you, Lord, are merciful and forgiving. He is pouring his love and his praise on God. <coughs> Excuse me. He's thanking God for his promises. And again, there's thousands of promises for you in the word of God. Spend time reading it every day and realize that those promises are for you. And then this is the next and what, I, what might be the most important step for so many of us. He does all of these things where he comes before God, he lets God speak to him, he focuses his, his attention on him, he prays to God with passion, he demonstrates his seriousness by fasting before the Lord, he thanks God for his promises, and then he humbly confesses his sins. Lay those things down before God. He knows it happened. God's everywhere. He was there in the moment when you did it. When you said that thing to your spouse that you can't get back, and it's like toothpaste out of the tube, God was there. When you dropped the ball, or when you cheated, or when you deceived somebody, or you sinned sexually, or you fell off the wagon into addiction, or whatever that thing, you know, addiction, or whatever that might be. God saw it. He was there. And he wants us to confess our sins. God doesn't listen to prideful complaining. He listens to humble confession. So let's be a people that humble ourselves before God. And be specific. Watch what Daniel did. Watch this. Verse 5, it says, We've sinned and done wrong, and we acted wickedly. We rebelled, turning aside from your commandments and rules. We have not listened to your servants and prophets who spoke your name to our kings, our princes, our fathers, and to all the people of the land. To us... Open shame because of the treachery that they have committed against you. To us, O oh Lord, belongs open shame to our kings and our princes and to our fathers because we have sinned against you. Daniel's not holding it back, is he? He's just confessing openly what that sin looks like. He's confessing his sins and the sins of his nation. He owns his stuff. That's one of the best character traits anyone could ever have, that when you make a mistake, you own it. You know what that will do? It will make people trust you. They will know that whether you do it right or wrong, they're going to hear the truth from you. And that reflects that you're a person of character. Nobody thinks that you're perfect. And if you try to uphold a persona that you are, everyone, especially the millennials and Gen Z, they will see straight through it. They can spot a fake like that. That's one thing they are great at. And if you stand in integrity and you own your mistakes and you own your stuff, it's going to be a greater reflection of what God is doing in you. Daniel owns it all. He says, we've not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God by walking in his laws, which he set before his servants and prophets. Oh my God, incline your ear and hear, for we do not present our pleas before you because of our righteousness, but because of your great mercy. And after he goes through all of these steps and all of this praying and fasting and seeking, God answers. God answers him through the angel Gabriel, you know, the, the trumpet player, right? He answers, and he says this. He sends Gabriel, and it says that um, he made me understand, speaking with me, saying, Oh, Daniel, I have now come out to give you insight and understanding. At the beginning of your pleas for mercy went a word, and I've come to tell it to you, for you are greatly loved. You see, the word is that God is going to fulfill that promise. And King Cyrus gives the edict that the Israelites can return 
back to their homeland, Jerusalem, in 538 B.C. God's promise to his people is something that he kept to them. And I believe this, as we've just celebrated our freedom and independence this past weekend, that there's a promise that God has for you. And I, you know, I've heard it said before that people have tried to make this nation specific, what I'm about to read to you in the scripture. It's not. It's a promise for the entire world. And it says simply this, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and and we will forgive their, he says, I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. 